Okay, hello everyone to our last international online seminar on interval methods in control engineering before the summer break. And it's my pleasure to have today with us Pierre Filiol, who is a PhD candidate with the Robex team of Enstra Bretagne. And Pierre's research activities are especially focused on accelerating interval methods, interval calculus with the help of FPGAs and yes, application scenarios as I think it's, it's quite natural uh, for the team of Robex, uh, definitely have to do with autonomous uh, underwater vehicles or more or less localization approaches uh, in the field of robotics. And without any further ado, I'll now hand over the microphone to you, Pierre. And yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, can you hear me well? Yeah, that's yeah. working perfectly fine. No. So, okay, so I'm going to start. So first of all, I would like to thank Andreas for inviting me to this seminar to present my work. So the, the main topic for today will be about um, how to integrate interval primitives uh, in hardware, for example, in FPGA, to uh, accelerate uh, the, the interval calculus and the performances. So I'm going to, to give first a very brief introduction about uh, the context of this work. So uh, all the elements from this talk are extracted from my ongoing PhD thesis, uh, whose subject is uh, hardware acceleration of interval calculus for mobile robotics. So it was started in September uh, 2022, and it is supervised by Luc Jolin, who is in the audience, and Jean-Christophe Lelan. Both uh, work at Ensta Bretagne, in Brittany, in France. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to make a short primer about uh, how interval methods are used in mobile robotics. Um, the main use we have for interval methods in mobile robotics is to characterize solution sets for uh, non-linear constraint satisfaction problems. So a lot of recurring problems in robotics can be um, explained uh, with this form. Uh, from uh, applications such as localization, uh, robust control, or parameter estimation. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a small unrelated uh, example uh, just to make sure everyone is familiar with this kind of technique. So let's suppose that we have a, a time discrete system which is inspired from an on map in which uh, next state depends from the previous state with um, a particular evolution function. So this function has, this system has the, the particularity uh, of uh, leading to non-defined uh, xk, depending of how you choose your initial vector. And so uh, the question we, we want to solve is um, how to find the set uh, of initial vectors such as uh, it leads to a, a defined uh, fifth state. So this is what you can see here, here at the at the bottom. Um, so to to solve this problem, we will build contractors and use a Palving algorithm such as Sivia to compute the sets of uh, initial vector that lead to something which is defined at state five. So this is something that is very recurring in robotics. Um, I would like now to introduce the principle of contractors which are uh, first-class citizen in robotics. Um, those co primitive contractors will be um, the building blocks for our interval accelerators. So uh, I briefly recall here the important properties of a contractor, which are contractance, monotonicity, and constituency. But I suppose you are all well familiar with this kind of stuff. Um, the main topic is that um, for uh, a particular robotic problem uh, where a solution set uh, is defined by a particular uh, mathematical expression, um, we can build a complex contractor using only a contractor primitives. So for example, at the bottom uh, in the table, you can see uh, some of the most usual uh, contractor primitives of your, or intervals. We can see that there is uh, arithmetic operators and algebraic operators. And um, for each of these operators, we typically use both forward and backward contractors. The thing is that we can use um, 
an algorithm such as HC4 revised to uh, derive uh, a complex uh, contractor from uh, primitive contractors. And by design, uh, a forward backward contractor, which is obtained uh, through composition of minimal uh, contractor, is guaranteed to be minimal as well. So I'm going to introduce this through a localization example. Um, so let's suppose that we have a robot which is navigating in a field of landmarks. So the robot is um, represented by the, the green triangle and the landmarks by the red dots. Uh, we can suppose that um, the, robo the robot have a set of sensors that gives uh, him the, the relative distance to each landmark. We can see here distance 1, distance 2, and distance 3. Um, obviously, uh, those measurements are interval because uh, there is some uncertainty due to sensor. So um, each landmark gives us uh, a constraint because the, the robot is supposed to be um, at a particular distance of each landmark. And um, as is, it is a triangular shell problem, the solution set for the whole localization problem is in fact the intersection of uh, each uh, each of those uh, of those sets. So um, we are going to perform uh, an HC4 revise uh, to build the contractor C1 for set one uh, for the first landmark. So um, the set um, is the solution. The, the solution for this set are the is the ring equation. So we are going to uh, build the abstract syntax tree of this expression here. So this allows us to uh, highlight all the operators that are required for this computation. We've got uh, addition, subtraction, and square uh, and square uh, operators. And using HC4 revise, we can um, build um, a forward backward contractors, which will have this um, expression. You can see on the left part, the forward part, and uh, at the, in the right part, the backward part. So as I said previously, um, this algorithm is written only using uh, contractor primitive. So we see here uh, uh, primitive for subtraction, primitive for square, and uh, backward counterpart for these uh, contractors. And uh, this contractors is also minimal by design. Um, now, if you want to solve our problem, uh, we can again use Sivia and uh, characterize the, the solution set. So in the left part, um, I have uh, plotted uh, the union for all the landmark constraints. And in the right part, I've plotted the intersection of all these sets, which is the estimated position of the robot. Um, I'm now going to detail the purpose of my study. So um, what we want to achieve with an hardware approach is an implementation which is tailored for robotics needs. Uh, the thing is that um, we believe that robotics problem, um, at least mobile robotics problem, uh, needs speed and reliability and do not care so much about being uh, very precise. Um, I mean, um, in, a, in a case like the, the one I just presented, uh, you will be fitted with sensor input uh, at each step. So even if you are not very precise on a result, uh, you can um, you can improve uh, your your post estimate with the next uh, sensor input. Um, and moreover, uh, dealing with things in hardware will allow us to to reach uh, the desired balance between speed and precision because we can use floating points. Um, that uh, can be uh, with the chosen uh, precision, which is impossible to do uh, in software. Um, we believe uh, this will also lead to an improved quality of life because uh, we will cut uh, dependencies to software math libraries, which can be quite hard to compile. Um, we can also provide some bindings to high level language such as C. And uh, another bonus uh, advantage is that we, we are likely to reach um, some lower energy consumption because hardware will typically, embedded hardware on FPGA 
will typically consume uh, less power, which is quite interesting for robotics because uh, we want uh, our robot to be able to operate for the longest time possible. Um, but there are some physical, philosophical questions that we need to answer. I think the, the question that is currently burning your lips uh, is, uh, can we gain speed compared to a traditional software approach? Um, I will divide this question into two parts. The, the first one is, can we improve things at the instruction level? Uh, for example, uh, am I able to, to perform a forward uh, addition contractor faster in hardware than in software? And the second one is, uh, as uh, as I'm in command of the hardware architecture, uh, can I do something to exploit data parallelism? Because we have this intuition that Sivia um, is applying the same computation on every boxes. So we should be able to handle several boxes in parallel and have a linear gain in performance. However, there is no easy answers to this question because it may heavily depend on the class of interval problems. Some contractors may, uh, may be uh, um, easier to parallelize than others. And the goal of my PhD will be to develop tools and metrics to characterize this. And uh, at the end, hopefully, uh, give some element to answer the question. So um, I don't know how familiar you are with hardware development, so I've chosen to be a more a bit pedagogic and explain how we produce hardware um, uh, for real. So um, there are two, ma two major technologies if you want to develop hardware. The first one is uh, ASIC, Application Specific Integrated Circuits. And the second one is, is FPGA, which means Field Gate Programmable Array. In fact, those technologies have complementary usage. Uh, for example, ASICs will target high performances and mass production uh, of chip, while FPGA is better suited for low budget and prototyping, which is exactly what we want to do uh, in uh, research. So um, just for your culture, I have introduced here um, the ASIC architecture that we won't use in this project. Um, you can see on the left part a microscope image of an ASIC chip. And in fact, um, this technology is not really that old for us because uh, it implies a, a very uh, complex flow of conception, which requires a very expensive software, very expensive facilities, because you are going to, to produce a code uh, that will uh, describe how to um, etch uh, a piece of silicone to engrave uh, your particular circuits. Uh, naturally, this process is destructive, which means that once you have uh, burned your, uh, your chip, you cannot go back uh, in time and there is no room for failure. So this is far too expensive for and, and difficult for us to use in research. However, the second technology, which is FPGA, is uh, a lot more suited uh, for research and prototyping. You can see on the top uh, image uh, uh, a photo of an FPGA evaluation board. Um, so the FPGA core is the chip in the middle here. Um, and in fact, you can see this device as a reusable box of elements. You can totally think of it as a Lego box. You've got uh, embedded uh, basic bricks that can be assembled to construct uh, very complex circuits. If we delve deeper into the anatomy of an FPGA chip, uh, you can see that uh, an FPGA is in fact a grid of uh, CLB, which has configurable logic blocks, which are uh, pieces together uh, through uh, a programmable interconnects. So the goal will be to change the, the interconnects to um, create your, your own circuits using basic blocks. So in the right part, you can see what is inside the uh, control logic blocks. I will now explain it here. So uh, inside the logic block, you can find uh, n input LUTs, which are lookup table. You can find full adders, flip-flop, and multiplexor. And in fact, um, with this basic block, you can produce uh, about any combinatorial circuit, uh, which is exactly what we want to do with FPGA. 
Uh, there are also other resources on HPJ which are uh, out of uh, configurable logic block but are very uh, important for us. The first one are DSP blocks, uh, which are um, heavily optimized blocks uh, who perform um, arithmetic operations such as addition or multiplication in fixed size. There are also memory elements such as block RAM, uh, which can be used to store uh, parameter tables. For example, uh, in algorithms such as Cordic for Cosinus, you need to store tables. Um, I'm going now to detail the process of uh, synthesis, which is in fact the operation uh, where you will uh, change how uh, CLB are connected. This is what I showed previously here. We are going to um, modify the connection in the programmable interconnects. So uh, here is a, a small code. Uh, which is uh, a piece of code, uh, uh, an HDL call, which means uh, hardware development, uh, hardware description language, sorry. Um, and in fact, the, this small code uh, produces um, a very simple circuit, which uh, is an end gate, so something very basic. We can see that we have two inputs, input one and input two, and uh, a result, uh, and we are going to perform uh, at in 15, um, uh, an end operator between the two input and return it in the as the result. So now that we have described how we want uh, our circuit our circuit to operate, uh, we need to perform a step which is called synthesis and will trigger the reconfiguration of the FPGA. So this is done through uh, a vendor specific uh, software, which gives us uh, very meaningful information about our design. Uh, in fact, this uh, software will tell us how much of our Lego box we have used. For example, uh, you can see that at the bottom left of this slide, uh, it will give us um, an estimate of the CLB logic utilization. We can see that previous design has used only five uh, CLB LUTs uh, because this is a really uh, small design. Uh, on the right part, uh, the, the software shows us also, um, uh, it gives us a graphic representation of the used CLB on the design. So this uh, photo is, uh, is not the example uh, compiled previously. Um, we can see that all the, the, blue, um, the blue part on the, the FPGA chip uh, corresponds to the, the used the configurable logic blocks uh, for the design. Uh, but more importantly, it will give us uh, estimate uh, estimation about the achieved performance, which is uh, the most important thing. Um, this leads to the, the question uh, about how to write efficient VHDL code, uh, because this is for sure very different from writing C. In fact, uh, the whole game of hardware programming is to find a, a compromise between three different variables, which are uh, the hardware resources. It is what I, I told, I explained previously, um, your Lego box is not infinite. So you need to, to be able to, to make your circuit uh, using what is available on your board. Another criteria is the maximum frequency, uh, which is directly uh, the performance of your design. Um, it is the, Yes, the, the maximum speed uh, at which your design will be able to operate. And there is also a third factor, which is the pipeline depth, uh, which is the number of required clock cycles to perform an operation. So uh, I'm going to illustrate this um, very fast uh, for people who, who don't know how it works. So let's suppose uh, um, that we have uh, an operation at, at the top. Uh, which is composed of four uh, sub-operations, A, B, C, and D. So every operation takes a predefined time to, to, to work. For example, A takes five nanoseconds, B, eight nanoseconds, which means that uh, we can perform our full chain in 29 nanoseconds. So uh, if we perform a uh, fast computation, this leads to uh, a 34 uh, megahertz uh, maximum frequency and a depth of, of one because we perform the whole operation into one clock cycle. 
So for some reason, uh, this maximum frequency may not be uh, enough uh, for design for for our project because we have a specific constraint. For example, for a particular robot, uh, this is not fast enough. You you need to to increase your, your speed. So you will perform an an operation which is called pipelining. So uh, in the bottom part, you will take the same operation, but between C and D, you will add a, a register block, which will save the output result of C and use it at the beginning of next uh, clock cycle um, to perform D. Uh, what we do um, by doing that is that we split the computation in half. So the maximum uh, period becomes 22 nanosecond, nanoseconds. And uh, we have managed to increase uh, our maximum frequency, which become 45 megahertz at the expense of an additional uh, pipeline death. So now we need two clock cycle to perform our operation. Um, the BP part is now, uh, how do you uh, compute floating point efficiently on FPGA? So um, as explained previously, uh, we need to be very careful and uh, adapt uh, the existing algorithm to uh, the specificity of FPGA architecture. So, uh, E triple E uh, 754 algorithm are still valid, but they must be handled with care. Uh, in fact, we will find that most textbooks uh, we describe hardware implementation do this uh, for ASIC style, uh, which as we saw previously has a much lower granularity. Um, so something that is optimized for ASIC will not be optimized for uh, FPGA. As a matter of example, you can see uh, at the bottom, um, a circuit for uh, something which is called a Wallace multiplier tree, which is made meant to perform uh, integer multiplication. So uh, in ASIC, you will chain together uh, half adder and full adders to uh, to get your result. But this approach is very uh, inefficient in VHDL because, as I said previously, you have something on the board which is called DSP. Uh, with embedded multipliers, and this is much uh, easier to use them uh, directly rather than copying um, the ASIC style implementation. So as you may be aware of, um, floating point computations uh, are very complex by nature, and they need uh, a lot of optimization to be really usable. The thing is that um, my, my project is a PhD uh, is a, is a PhD work, so uh, I can't afford to uh, redevelop every uh, primitive uh, in hardware to implement all the contractor that I uh, showed uh, previously. So um, we are going to use uh, what has been made for the Flopoco project, uh, which is a project which started um, in 2008 at INRIA in France. Uh, so I've given the link to the original publication if you are interested. And what this project does for us is that it generates custom floating point primitives which are optimized for FPGA. Um, so the, the tools offers to create uh, directly the VHDL files uh, that we can use in another project. And the, the best part about uh, this generator is that you can use a custom floating point format. As I said previously, this is the major interest of uh, hardware implementation. You can also uh, choose uh, your target maximum frequency, and you can also uh, uh, choose uh, the desired FPGA chips because there are, there are several uh, vendors for FPGA chips and there are slight uh, difference in architecture uh, which can have an impact of uh, on uh, on your design and your code. So this um, uh, this project will handle those differences for us, and this will be invisible. Um, as a short summary of the Poco project, uh, you can find the figure on the left, uh, which uh, explains what I just told. Told um, to generate a particular file, we uh, feed. Um, the specification about our floating point format. And uh, we also give a uh, desired frequency and uh, FPGA targets. What it does for us, for example, 
uh, in the right part. If we want to generate uh, a floating point adder uh, with 8 bits of exponent and 33 bits of mantissa, we just have to type this command and um, the and the project will generate for us all the required uh, VHDL file. We can see here that it can uh, achieve this design for a frequency of uh, 400 megahertz with a pipeline depth of 10. So it needs 10 clock cycle to be able to perform this computation. So the practically, this is very difficult to, to make. Um, and uh, and the, the project handle the pipelining for us. Uh, yes, so now I'm going to talk a bit specifically about how to design interval primitives in hardware. So uh, the main question is which primitive should be treated in hardware to accelerate intervals? So as stated obviously, um, previously, contractors on elementary arithmetics and algebraic operators are the main target because we saw that through HC4 revised, we can uh, generate uh, any contractor uh, by uh, composing uh, primitives one. So I have uh, I have uh, included this table again to show uh, what are the targets for um, for our acceleration. Uh, the thing is that uh, Flopoco uh, gives us uh, all the required hardware primitives uh, for floating point. Um, to further build our uh, our operators. So this is a work that is currently in progress uh, in my PhD uh, and which will be publicated soon, soon. So I advise you to stay tuned if you are interested in this problematic. Um, and the last part I wanted to explain is uh, how to integrate uh, those hardware primitives for interval into a RIS-5 processor. So uh, if you are interested in this particular topic, uh, the upcoming part has been accepted in the special edition of Acta Cybernetica under the following uh, title. So I advise you to, to check if you are interested. Um, so the, the main question that drove this article is how to expose uh, our hardware primitive to the user, because currently, uh, with what I've explained uh, previously, we are we are stuck with um, uh, interval primitive uh, on your on the FPGA. But now we need to um, allow the user to access those primitives in order to be able to uh, perform uh, his particular robotics problem. Um, so the solution we came with in the article is to extend an existing instruction set architecture. So. Um, the, the major benefit of this approach is that interval instruction will cohabit with standard ones. Uh, and in fact, we don't have to choose uh, between one or the other. So we can, uh, a lot of the existing code can still run in this environment. Um, another benefit is that uh, CPU are the most widespread computing models. So people don't have to, to learn anything new. And um, due to uh, compilers, we can uh, call uh, those primitive hardware instructions from a high level language such as C. However, there is a big problem. Um, generous, general purpose instruction set such as x86 cannot be modified freely because they are commercial products. For example, you can modify uh, anything in your general purpose desktop uh, processor. So a solution to this problem came uh, with the RIS-5 standard, um, which is an open specification for uh, an instruction set. Uh, it comes royalty free, so anyone is free to implement a RIS-5 standard compliant core. Uh, it has the advantage of being relatively simple. And the biggest uh, feature for us is the ability to to build a chip with modularity and extensibility. I will now explain to you what this means. Uh, on this schematic, you can see uh, all the standard extensions for, for RISC-5. Uh, you can see extensions as a list of um, hardware instructions that are geared toward uh, a common goal. For example, the I extension 
uh, will regroup all the instructions to work with base integer. Uh, however, we have uh, other stuff, for example, for floating point computation with the F extension, double with the D, or maybe more fancy stuff such as packed SCMD with extension P. And if you are curious, for example, uh, you can see here a list of the, the instructions that are embedded in some uh, extension. For example, you can see that in the I extension, we have all the, the basic operation that we expect to find in a modern CPU, such as addition, subtraction, uh, logic operation, shift, and, uh, and, the, and more. So uh, if you need to remember one thing about RISC-5, uh, it can be seen as an on-demand processor. The goal is to craft your core with only what you need and not what you are required to, to use. Um, this leads to a lot of possibility for the configuration. So cores are named after uh, their embedded extension. For example, RV32 EMAFD, which is a 32-bit RIS-5, which embeds uh, I, M, A, F, and D extensions. Um, another very interesting uh, feature of RIS-5 is the fact that you can extend um, the standard extension with your custom extension. It means that if I have a, a particular uh, application um, which is too niche to enter um, official standard, you still have the, the tools to uh, add it to a RIS-5 core. So this is exactly what we are going to do uh, with Robotics. Uh, another bonus is that RIS-5 comes with a, a very complete software, software stack. So we can use um, a GCC um, and we can modify it to take into account our uh, new instruction. So as a bonus, we immediately uh, gain uh, C binding of uh, those primitives. Um, so in the article that I mentioned previously, uh, we show in depth how to specify um, a custom extension set which contain contractor primitive instructions. We also saw how we can modify a GCC to uh, produce binary which use uh, interval instruction. And we uh, run uh, this kind of code in an emulated RIS-5. For example, uh, for, for instance, everything is made in software, uh, but we manage to run the initial localization code um, problem that I show at the beginning. So you, you can go and check that if you are interested. Um, at the end, we gain native C support for interval, and we are able to compile this kind of code. You can see, for example, at Lean uh, 11, uh, we can make direct uh, assembly call to a function which is called add forward contractor. So we, we perform the forward uh, addition contractor um, using our hardware primitives. Um, I'm now going to conclude this speech and give prospects about future works. So um, the next big step is to integrate our uh, hardware primitives uh, in a soft core RIX-5. So um, this is why I, I took the time to present the FPGA uh, platform. Um, in fact, um, RIX-5 core can be shipped as software. Uh, as a code base of HDL uh, software, which can be synthesized into a fully fledged processor on an FPGA. It means that it means that you can uh, take some code and generate a processor that you can use, for example, boot Linux or or what you want. Um, those core will uh, implement the RIS-5 standard to various extents. Some can be sold. For example, Sci-5 is a company that has made a living uh, about selling. Um, those soft scores, uh, but some are also distributed royalty free and they are heavily used uh, in the research field because they, they are free and uh, documented enough to, in, to add what you want. So there has been a lot of uh, work uh, on the subject for cryptographic processor or for uh, video encoding and uh, stuff like that. So uh, we are going to do the same with intervals. So in the upcoming work, we are going to modify uh, uh, shelf, an on-shelf RIS-5 soft core to uh, add our interval primitive uh, boosted with Flopoco. Um, 
we believe that RISC V is quite an interesting platform for, uh, for us because it can help us to provide execution metrics. The initial philosophical question was, is it really faster to go hardware? So I believe that in RISC V is the fairest comparison that can be made. For example, for a given robotic problem, for the localization, uh, we can perform um, the contractor code for localization using only a standard instruction, in our case, EMAFD, um, and we can uh, get execution metrics. And we can directly compare that with the same code, which has been compiled uh, to use uh, standard instruction and interval specific instructions and compare uh, the results and the performances. So this is the end of my speech. So I hope uh, you found that interesting and not too hard to follow. And I will gladly take questions if there are any. So many thanks, Pierre, for your very interesting presentation. And I'm sure there will be some questions. Who wants to start? I do not see any raised hand at the moment. Just unmute yourself if you have a question. If not, I can start with two questions. What you mentioned at the beginning uh, of your presentation is that commonly in CVR-like uh, algorithms, you want to exploit da data parallelism. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on this, how uh, your FPGA uh, implementation will benefit uh, from this? Oh, um, what I see is that uh, I'm going to find the uh, yes yeah, here. So um, what we have uh, that we have an initial box in Sevilla that we are going to bisect uh, several time and perform the same contractor uh, to generate a, pay a paving. So what we could typically do uh, is uh, use uh, about the same model that is used in, uh, for example, GPU where we are going to um, uh, to um, use several instances of uh, basic core to um, to perform computation on different data. Here, uh, this, this can be the boxes. Um, and this can help to process uh, all the boxes in parallel and uh, get the paving faster that, uh, taking, uh, rather than taking each box uh, one by one. Okay, yes. that means that's something like a stream processing model for classical GPU. Yeah. Yes, but um, obviously this is something that is much more complex than building uh, only one core. So maybe this won't be something that we will have the time to explore in my PhD thesis. But uh, the, um, the, the main goal is currently to produce one core, uh, which is correct and uh, perform all the computation. And um, for uh, if someone wants to, to work on the topic, uh, he will have uh, data to, to try to parallelize all these processors. Okay, and in fact, you have now already mentioned one word uh, that stimulates that my second question, the correctness. How do you verify correctness at the end of your implementation? Do you exploit some kind of test set uh, in order to make sure that, for example, directed rounding is performed properly? Uh, on oh. that all, all the enclosure properties of interval arithmetics are satisfied because I know, for example, for the standardization of interval arithmetic in the yeah. IEEE 1788, there was also some discussion about developing test sets. Yes. yes. And in order how to verify correctness of programs being compliant with the standard. So uh, what I have done to, to try to estimate correctness, uh, in fact, this has been done um, in the article here. Um, the goal of this article was to uh, try to um, modify the software stack of, uh, of RIS-5. And uh, this has been done through uh, emulation, as I explained um, here. Yes. So um, what I've done uh, in this emulator is that uh, every interval uh, primitive is a is, uh, program using uh, software. So I have uh, made a wrapper on uh, the lib uh, E triple E uh, 1788, which is the standard for intervals. So I've got, um, uh, at the same time as my 
hardware implementation, I've got a kind of golden model, um, which use uh, software, which is not has normally been verified. Uh, and I can compare uh, both results step by step to track error and differences. Okay, and which uh, of those uh, standardized uh, interval models do you treat? Because in 1788, there exists the one with the decorations. Uh, yeah. There exists a model, a uh, simplified interval arithmetic model that has also been, I think it was the 1788.1 yeah, standards. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, I'm I'm not doing anything too fancy here. I'm just using the the basic set by set based interpretation of intervals, um, which give me uh, already uh, enough problems. So I'm unlikely to to try to do something else uh, any anytime soon. But uh, I know just inside the ten the the 1788 standard, there are very conflicting views about uh, what is an interval and what uh, is a valid interval. So, um, so yes, the, this is a, a burning topic currently. So, <laughs> okay, that means really you're focusing on the fundamentals of the yeah. set based flavor, how it was called in the standard. Yes, and this is the one that you're implementing. Okay, yes. great. Do we have any other question from the audience? Yes, uh, uh Fabrice. <laughs> Tell us, uh, can you comment a little bit more the the C samples that you show near the end? Yes, yeah, of course. And for example, I, I was wondering uh, about the, the first line. Uh, you you begin with type def interval as double. Does that yeah. mean that in inside your implementation you you modify the double type so yeah. that it okay? Yes, in fact, uh, so the um, line two is a is a compilation trick. But in fact, uh, so it is explained in the article in detail. You 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 can check if you are interested. But uh, what we do is that we are basing our implementation on um, a RIS five that uses the D extension, and the D extensions uh, brings uh, sixty four uh, sixty four with uh, registers that are used to hold double. So what we do is that we uh, use these uh, registers to store our interval. So we use a 64 um, representation um, for, uh, for interval, which um, uses, uh, which uh, is composed of the two bounds and uh, some flags. And in fact, what we do uh, that w when we want to uh, load an interval, we are going to load inside a double register uh, but the, the interval won't be interpreted as a double. Uh, we have specific uh, uh, hardware primitive to retrieve uh, both uh, bounds and uh, flags such as MT or IOTA. Okay, thank you. Is there any further question? Okay, this... Doesn't seem to be the case. Now it's your last uh, chance to ask a question. If there's no one else who wants to ask anything, many thanks again, Pierre, for your interesting presentation. Thank also you for, for invitation. For the discussion. And yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's talk, this has been the last presentation before our summer break. And all of you will receive the corresponding invitation for the restart, which is scheduled for the middle or end of September in our seminar series. Have a nice summer break and see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.